Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask to take the f your seat, please, so that we can uh, uh, start this uh, uh, meeting, uh, what is, uh, in fact, uh, a public here, uh, a public briefing that we organize. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome uh, you today to this public briefing with uh, Michal Ignatiev, uh, who is, as you know, the president and director of the Central European uh, university uh, at, uh, uh, in Budapest, and we hope that it continues to be Budapest. So I would uh, have liked to uh, debate uh, with Mr. Ignatiev one of his many fascinating books that I like much more. Uh, I'm one uh, of uh, an admirer of uh, Mr. Ignatiev and of his book, uh, uh, Fire and Ashes. If you have some doubts about your political career uh, or problems that you face in politics, read that book. It's the way to be re-engaged in politics. It's a very positive book about uh, politics and politic uh, activities. But unfortunately, uh, we have a much less inspiring, in my opinion, issue to deal with today. And that is, uh, as you all know, an existential threat uh, to one of the uh, leading universities uh, in Europe. A threat, uh, in fact, tr triggered by a formerly uh, liberal, nowadays increasingly authoritarian prime minister, uh, who decided, in fact, that uh, this academic institution and center of free thinking is a dangerous check uh, on his power, and also an obstacle on, on his way to what he is calling an illiberal uh, democracy. Uh, Michael Ignatiev has been leading the struggle for the preservation uh, of uh, CEU in Hungary. Uh, we also, tens of thousands of people backing him uh, in the streets of uh, Budapest and many more sending their support uh, from uh, all over Europe and all over the world. And it is, in fact, a, a struggle uh, more than on uh, the CU for academic freedom and also a struggle, I think, for the free thinking uh, in uh, Europe and in the European Union. So I'm therefore very pleased that the five main political groups in the European Parliament are jointly hosting uh, this briefing and are also present uh, today and uh, before uh, giving the floor to Rector Ignatiev, I would ask my colleague Sabine Verheyen, uh, who is the EPP coordinator in the CULT Committee, for a short introduction. Thank you very much. Also from my side, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ignatiev, for being here. Uh, you already were with us in the coordinators meeting in CULT Committee just a uh, just one hour ago, so uh, we already had the possibility for a short exchange, and I'm quite happy that we can have this here now in, in this event on a broader uh, 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 range. So 
Hungary's parliament approved this Hungarian Higher Education Act beginning of April that appeared to be written to force the closing of a university, the latest step in what observes see as a crackdown on free expression and liberal values. New amendments to an existing higher education law affect about two dozen universities, but uh, they, in, in, the, in the public they were widely believed to be aimed specifically at Central European University based in Budapest. The university, known as CEU, has been operating in Hungary partly as an American institution and uh, relatively free of Hungarian oversight, but the amendment law contains a provision that would most likely restrict the independence of universities that offer diplomas from countries where they do not have a campus or offer courses, a provision that would affect only Central European University. On the other hand, uh, this university is also an accredited university under Hungarian law, so uh, there is a, a, a two, side, uh, uh, two sides of this university. Uh, with the one side, there are no problems. With the other side, uh, there uh, are new problems coming up with the new legislation. Today's discussion allows us to collectively take stock of the issue, issues at hand in an objective, objective fact-based and law-based manner. As member of the German delegation of EPP, I have concerns centered around the Central European Universities, and this is the most known in the, uh, of the 28 institution concerns. It stands for internationalism, openness and tolerance, all values that we consider um, our shared European values. Uh, that also the EPP stands for. And even though we personally might disagree with some of the opinions voiced in such an academic institution, we can very much value that such an institution exists and how important it is, especially in our democratic structures, to have this uh, diverse approach. Our shared European values are set out in Article 2 of the Treaty on Europe of the European Union. And there it is said, the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. These common values include as well freedom of education and research and are not open for compromise. And I think all political parties in our house are standing for these fundamental values and the freedom of research and education. Uh, the Commission announced to investigate the compatibility of the Hungarian law with the acquis of the European Union. And if the result shows that improvements have to be made, the Hungarian government should comply and adapt its law. We as European Parliament and we as EPP group will observe very attentively the effects the new law will have on the higher education landscape in Hungary, as well as the related developments, because not just your university might be tackled by this, but also other who might offer uh, uh, degrees from other countries all over Europe and all over the world. And one of our main aims also in the question of education is that we get a broad possibility for young people to get degrees and accepted degrees from all over the world so that they have a possibility to enter working, the working market, uh, the, the labor market all over the world and have uh, the best educated people in our, our region. So uh, also to attract people from other parts of the world, it's quite very important to have uh, such uh, foreign degrees also available in our European countries and also in Hungary. So I'm looking forward to the exchange we will have to you and to get some clearness on the questions and facts uh, that are already delivered. Thank you very much. Mr. Ignacio, you have the floor. Well, I, I thank you uh, on behalf of myself and on behalf of my embattled university for this chance to talk to distinguished parliamentarians. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank uh, everybody for coming. There's a large crowd here. Um, it signals your concern. The issue that we're concerned about is, is really quite simple. My, my job here is not to tell Europe what to do. My job, that's the competence of political figures and leaders. Uh, my job is simply to tell you what's at stake. And what's at stake is that this would be the first time since 1945 in Europe that a member state of the European Union sought to close down a free university. 
and that's a serious matter. It involves fundamental issues of human and European values, and I want to tell you uh, my perspective on the legislation that's been proposed. I think the first thing to say about it is that in any democratic society where a government has a issue with a university, because universities have obligations and responsibilities to the country they're in, and any good university takes those seriously, a government will then consult with a university and take it into its confidence and say, we have a problem with this or we have a problem with that. Uh, this was not followed in the Hungarian case. Uh, without any consultation, without any warning, without any discussion of any kind, on the 28th of March, the Hungarian government tabled in the Hungarian parliament legislation that in our view would make it impossible for us to operate in Hungary. And the legislation was then rapidly passed through the Hungarian parliament, signed into law by the president. We have immediately appealed its constitutionality on the grounds that there is in the Hungarian basic law very clear and explicit guarantees of academic and scientific freedom, which we believe were violated by the legislation. Uh, let me try and describe in as concise a way as I can what the problem with the legislation is. We've been in Hungary for 25 years. We were founded in order to assist the democratic transition of Hungary and Eastern Europe from communism to democratic societies. And we're immensely proud of the fact that over 25 years we've graduated 15,000, close to 15,000 graduates who are spread out across the world, particularly in Eastern Europe. We've trained honest people who respect knowledge, who care about freedom, who care about civil inquiry, who care about democratic values. And they are at work, I, f I suspect, in the commission in Europe, in, in these parliament buildings today. And we're immensely proud of the quiet contribution that they've made to European liberty. We are a Hungarian institution, proud of the part we've played in Hungarian academic life, and we're also an American institution. I happen to be a Canadian, but that's okay. I work with Americans. Um, and um, we're like a citizen with two passports. We have a Hungarian identity, of which we're immensely proud. We are accredited. Some of our programs are accredited in Hungary, and most of our programs are accredited in the United States. We have students from 120 countries who come to Budapest because Budapest is a wonderful city, a much respected seat of learning with an enormously important intellectual tradition of which we're proud to be a part. And they come to Budapest to get a master's and PhD degree, PhD degree accredited in the United States. This legislation would make it impossible to continue as we have been doing because first of all, it would require as a condition of operation in Hungary, a binding bilateral international agreement between the United States government and the government of Hungary ratifying our ability to practice in Hungary. Now the problem with that, as you know, as I'm sure you're all acute scholars of the United States Constitution, is the United States government does not have jurisdiction in relation to higher education at all. We've pointed this out respectfully, but it is a problem. That is, we've been presented with an impossible demand, it's just jurisdictionally impossible. What we have said is, okay, you want a new international agreement? We could find one between the state of New York. The state of New York has jurisdiction and it accredits our programs. Uh, and so there is a small possibility that with a new international agreement between the state of New York and the government of Hungary that guaranteed our academic freedom, let me make clear, we might be able to continue. But there's no sign from the Hungarian government that such an agreement is possible. The second requirement they have is that we have a campus in the United States. Now, they make it sound as if we're an exceptional institution in this regard, not having a campus in the United States. I should point out, as a matter of fact, that 30 American institutions operate overseas without campuses in the United States. Think of the American University in Cairo. Think of the American University in Beirut. Think of the American University in Central Asia. They don't have campuses in the United States. We have no objection in principle to having a campus, although it's a vexatious uh, interference in our academic freedom. 
In other words, if I didn't have a gun pointed to my head, I might consider a campus. But the, uh, the passing strange aspect of this is that a Hungarian government, a nationalist government, is asking me to educate Hungarians in New York. I want to educate them in Budapest. So the third element of this is in some sense the most serious problem for us. I said to you we're a university with a European identity, that is a Hungarian identity, accreditation in Hungary, but also accreditation in middle states and New York State. What the legislation is saying is you've got to choose between those identities. You can't be both. You can stay in Hungary as a Hungarian institution under essentially the authority of the Orban government, but you can't issue uh, master's and PhD degrees accredited in, uh, in the United States. And since people come from 120 countries to study in Budapest and then get an American degree, it's an attempt to split an institution that is not two institutions. It's one institution with two passports. They're asking us to choose between passports, and we simply refuse. It's a fundamental matter of academic freedom because if a university can't choose what degrees it offers, it doesn't have the freedom it requires in order to function properly. The final element of the legislation that is vexatious in our view is, I've just said I'm a Canadian, so I'm not an EU citizen. We have many EU, non-EU citizens employed in our, in our university. Uh, it is one of the freedoms of Europe that non-EU research workers have mobility uh, guaranteed in, uh, in the European acquis, and this acquis has been revoked by this legislation. Henceforward, we would have to submit work permits for all of our non-EU nationals, and we think that this will be an instrument to restrict our freedom to recruit. Um, these are the essential elements of, of the problem, and, and in addition to that problem, there has been a discourse coming out of the Hungarian government from the prime minister on down that we are irregular, that we play fast and loose with the regulations. There's a whole discourse that you will hear out there which is defamatory, to be blunt. It's a defamatory attack on an institution that has been scrupulous about complying with Hungarian law, is deeply respectful of the country in which we're in, has no other desire than to remain in Hungary and contrib contribute to Hungarian academic life, and is punctilious about its observation of all relevant Hungarian rules. Our problem is that they've just changed the rules in a unilateral form without any consultation, whatever. So this is where we are, uh, cher collègue and cher ami. Um, our, our desire is to remain in Hungarian academic life. Uh, our desire is to contribute, to contribute to Hungarian academic life. We are, proud, we are proud of the support we've received around the world. Um, I sit here and every four minutes my, my Blackberry pings and I get another letter of support from a university around the world. 650 universities and counting. 24 Nobel laureates have lent their support to us. And it's not abstract. These are Nobel laureates who've been on our campus and worked and collaborated with our researchers. But the support that has mattered most to us emotionally, morally, and politically has been the support from Hungarian higher education. One of the greatest institutions in Hungary, one of the institutions with which we feel deep pride and affinity, is the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, founded in the 1850s by a great Hungarian, Count Szechenyi. It's 500 yards from our door. They have stood behind us as we've fought to defend academic freedom because they understand that our fight is a fight for all Hungarian academic institutions. The great institutions of Corvinus, Elte, many other universities in Hungary have lent us their support. And that is one additional reason why 70,000 Hungarian citizens paraded through the streets of Budapest six or seven days ago in support of academic freedom in Hungary. Because they understand there's a deep and intimate connection between academic freedom and democratic freedom. And the attack upon us is an attack not on a liberal institution, I want to stress, but on a free institution. The issue here is our freedom. 
not our political ideology or persuasions. I don't teach liberalism at CEU, although I am a proud liberal. I teach knowledge, I teach science, I teach mathematics, I teach cognitive science, I teach medieval history, or I don't teach it, my distinguished colleagues do. We're a university, we're not a NGO, we're not a political organization, we pose no challenge whatever to the Hungarian government. Our desire, our keen desire is for me not to be in this room, not to be defending my university, but actually go back to work and do what I've been proud to do all my life as a professor and academician. And I frankly, to conclude, I need the support of Europe. I have support in Washington. I have support in Berlin. I have support in Budapest, as I've said. I've got support in Munich. It's now time to get some support in Brussels. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip, uh, Philip Lambert for the Greens. Can I give you a shorter floor yeah. and then to Gabi afterwards? Yeah, the first uh, thing I'd like to say is that I, I find it very odd uh, to hear, <clears throat> well, to see actually a prime minister of a European country that is prone to denounce Brussels as the new Moscow, referring to the good old times of the Warsaw Pact, and actually sourcing its inspiration for legislation precisely in Moscow. Because what we are seeing now with the NGO law, what we are seeing now with university law, uh, has no European inspiration. That is, well, you, uh, unless you consider, of course, Moscow to be part of, uh, of Europe, which it geographically is. But in terms of value, of course, we are talking about something completely different. And this is something that should, we should be very wary of. And so, indeed, Michel, you can count, of course, on the support of this parliament. I mean, if as many political groups uh, which present the, the overwhelming majority of this parliament are standing by you, it's not, it's not by chance, because we do believe that what's at stake, and I like very much what you said, you cannot separate academic freedom from democratic freedom, because knowledge liberates the mind. And that is, of course, what probably uh, scares Mr. Orban. And I, I find it a bit odd because, well, he enjoys such an overwhelming majority in his own country that he shouldn't be afraid of any, anyone, right? So uh, I would relish uh, a controversy if I enjoyed uh, his kind of majority. But okay, that's uh, where we are today. Uh, dear friends and, and colleagues, uh, I know that at the moment many of us are looking towards Paris and what is going to happen in, in two weeks, well, two weeks from now. And I know that uh, Marine Le Pen is often used as a sort of, uh, of uh, epouvantail of, uh, of uh, how do you call that in English? I mean, something to scare, uh, hmm? a, scarecrow. a scarecrow, yeah, exactly. But actually, what worries me more, and I just want to be very clear on that, I'm not so much afraid of the national populist parties, you know, I'm much more afraid of their ideas contaminating traditional political families. I mean, the ones that really have been at the roots of the European project. And indeed, uh, well, uh, and, and I know that not all EPPs uh, support uh, uh, Orban, but having people like Orban and Fizzo part of, uh, of these two big families, which have been at the roots of the European Union, is deeply, deeply worrying. So we should never consider that democracy is, can be taken for granted, uh, that liberties are taken for granted. I mean, these are always at risk. And if we let these go down the drain in one EU countries, others will follow. Thank you. Gabi. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ignatieff, for coming here to Brussels to speak and to, to give us information about the situation um, of the, uh, on the, uh, the Central European University in Budapest. I love Hungary. Um, for me, for my generation, especially coming from Eastern Europe and uh, Eastern Germany, former GDR, Hungary was a symbol of freedom. It was Hungary opening first in Europe the borders 
for, for people from my country and also from, uh, for friends of mine. And that's why it's hard to understand what was going on in the last years and decades. I can't understand it because I know that the Hungarians are, are people who are very, very, very frank. They are very interested. They are very um, living in a global world. They are living in a global world. And that's why I, I think it's necessary to, to stand on the position that we as a European Union that we have to, to address to the government in Budapest to um, not to close the university, as you said before, uh, without any discussion, without any warning. This new um, law was, um, was decided and it, was, it concerns only your university. And it's clear, this is a Lex CEU. And uh, against that, we have to discuss and, and to, to raise our voices. It seems that tomorrow during our debate in the mini plenary session, Mr. Orban, the president of um, the Hungarian Republic will join. And I think this could be a good opportunity for all the political groups to raise our voices and to, to say clearly that we can't accept, that we can't accept that first time since, you also raised it, since 1942, in Europe, university will be closed. And we have to think on the students on your university. We have to, to think on, on the staff on your university. And we have to know if, if you now are not able as a university to prepare the next semester. This will be a catastrophe for you, for the whole university, for the academic, for the scientific life in Hungary and in, in Europe. That's why we are standing on your side. I'm going to take two, three questions that normally I'm not very uh, difficult on speaking time, not uh, when it is for myself anyway. So, uh, But uh, this time I'm going to do it. So. Uh, uh, I take two, three questions, and then uh, uh, Mr. Ignacio, if you respond in one uh, round to, uh, to them, because Mr. Pitella, the leader of the SND, will make the conclusions of this. Uh, uh, of this. Uh. So, um, who wants to take the floor? I take one there, one there, and Sophie there. So that's my deputy uh, leader. Favoritism. So I cannot do anything else. <laughs> Please start. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, Thomas Jorgensen from the European University Association. We, of course, I mean, I can just say you're right. The university sector is such, uh, completely behind the CEU on this. We, we made several statements. This, this, you, you, you'll know this. Um, but I want to ask about something else. You used the expression that you, your university is a canary in a coal mine. And from what we can see, would you agree to the university sector sort of being a canary in a coal mine in a world where we see a temptation to look inwards and be closed. And since we're a sector that lifts off openness and lifts off being able to an open exchange and open movement of people and the rest of it, that we're a sector that's a canary and a coal mine in a world of Trumps and Orbans and, and the rest of it. Thank you, please. Your question. Hi, uh, my name is Nick Wallace. I'm a graduate of the Central European University. I was at the, what was then the Department of Public Policy. Um, after this amendment was passed, uh, you said that you intended to proceed as if Hungary is a normal and democratic country that respects the rule of law. Now, I, I don't know if this was your intention, but when you said that, the, uh, I was reminded of Václav Havel, who said that in unfree societies we should resist by living as if we were free. And I mention this because it seems to me that academic freedom is just one target among many that's come under attack over the last six or seven years in Hungary. It's, it's also, you know, all the targets have been the, the broadcasters and the regulators and the courts and the press. And the academic freedom is less a city under siege than an edifice in a very crowded neighborhood under very heavy bombardment. So my question to you is when you look out from that edifice, do you see 
a solution that somehow exempts CEU from that bombardment as it continues? Um, or is CEU now facing an as-if situation? Uh, Sophie. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Ignatia, for, for being here. Just a short observation and a question. You mentioned your teaching medieval history. That, that happened to be my, my discipline when I was a student. And if you look at universities in the Middle Ages, there was basically limitless freedom. It was actually a precondition for universities to be recognized, uh, to take in students and teachers from other parts of, of the continent and other parts of the world. So basically, Orban is going back in time to before the Middle Ages. Um, but my question is, this is, we're talking now about CEU, but that's of course only, like the previous speaker said, it's only a symptom of something that has been going on for much longer. And that is silencing any critical voices, any opposition, uh, media, the constitutional judges, uh, NGOs, but also in the sector of education and academia. This has been going on for quite some time. And therefore, I, I'm actually surprised that people are taking to the streets only now, because I think academia has been under pressure for some time. Funding has been cut. Uh, the the, the um, uh, government is interfering actively in the, the curriculum of schools. So how do you see the further development of this protest movement? Hmm? Thank you. Mr. Ignacio. Thank you for these uh, observations and comments. Um, I'm particularly uh, grateful for the observation of my German colleague to my right, um, because she points out a date that I think we all need to keep in mind. This legislation comes into effect on October 11th, 2017, in less than six months. I have a, my institution has a gun pointed to its head. I can't accept students after the 1st of January, 2018. Uh, unless we can find a compromise, a solution which safeguards the academic freedom of this institution, and I see it lying possibly within a uh, bilateral agreement between the state of New York and the government of Hungary that would guarantee our academic freedom in very explicit terms. Um, uh, we have this gun pointed at our head. But I want to make another point clear that perhaps I haven't made as clear as I should. And that is under no circumstances whatever will CEU close. In all circumstances, we will maintain the continuity of our academic programs. Uh, that needs to be very importantly understood in this room and everywhere. Uh, we are not under an existential threat. We will survive in all circumstances. Um, we're a free institution, a private institution. We have the resources to continue. My stated objective and my actual objective is to remain in Budapest. It's our home, we've done nothing wrong, we've contributed quietly to Hungarian academic life for 25 years. Our sole desire is to remain in that city. But whatever happens, we never close. And I think everybody in the room needs to understand our absolute determination on that score. Many of you have asked um, about uh, essentially the agenda of the Orban government. And I will not be drawn on what that agenda is or where the sources of it come from or what's going on. Um, I want to make a much simpler point, uh, which is that whatever agenda you may have, you should never take a university hostage. That's the issue. The issue is not what his agenda is, but whether it is permissible for a European state in service of some agenda to take a university hostage. And this is what must be resisted. I'm not going to be drawn on what Mr. Orban's ultimate intentions are, what his vision of the world is, what his views on democracy are. It's actually above my pay grade, as we say in the United States. What I do know is that it's impermissible in Europe to have a, any political leader of progressive views, conservative views, whatever views, to take a university hostage in service of his agenda. That's the issue that the council needs to think about and take action about, because that's what's impermissible about what's, about what's happened. Um, 
Finally, if I can just make a, uh, a one point, uh, uh, one of our colleagues has made reference to me the medieval past. And it allows me to say something that I think helps us to connect this issue to some of the deepest traditions of European life. If you think about the oldest self-governing institutions in Europe, many of them are universities. Bologna, Sorbonne, Oxford, Cambridge, Charles University, um, great universities in, in Hungary. These are universities that have understood self-government among the first institutions in Europe. They were called societies of scholars. And we apprehend the deep connection between European democratic values and this long thousand-year-old tradition of academic self-government. And I want us to apprehend that. About a month ago, I didn't really know what academic freedom was, to be frank. I thought it was just that privilege that professors have that they can't be fired. And I've discovered slowly that what academic freedom truly is is the right of free institutions to govern themselves free of state interference and the interference of those who finance it. Academic freedom has two sides. You have to be free of government and you have to be free of those who pay the bills. And we can honestly say we're free in both of those dimensions. But that's the stake. European society depends critically on the capacity of institutions to govern themselves freely. And this, to conclude, is not a partisan issue. This is not a liberal issue. This is not a conservative issue. It's not a socialist issue. It's an issue that all Europeans can unite around. The sense that universities have earned the right to govern themselves. Conversely, and finally, universities have a deep obligation to the societies that they serve. I am proud of the fact that we train young Hungarians to be honest citizens. I'm proud of the fact that we train people who serve in the current government of Hungary, including in very senior positions. I'm proud of the fact that we have graduates occupying positions of responsibility all over the world. That's what universities do. They have a responsibility to these societies to train leadership, to train competence, to train knowledge, and to train skill. Uh, we don't change the world, but we do teach people what knowledge is. We teach people to be careful about facts, to be careful about evidence, to have respect for the traditions that have made us free. This is the work of a university. We have the right to govern ourselves and we have the responsibility to serve the societies in which we're lucky to operate. I'm deeply proud of what we've contributed to Hungarian life and I have no other desire than to continue to do so. Thank you very much for your attention. Gianni, can you ask you to take the floor uh, to make the conclusions of today? Grazie, Guy. Thank you, Guy. Well, I don't feel I need to to draw conclusions. I don't feel I need to do that. Just uh, want to make my own personal contribution and contribution to my group to this discussion. I want to thank the rector very much for, for coming along. This is a special day for many of us. It's the 25th of April. It's the uh, Feast of the Liberation uh, from Fascism in Italy, and the presence of the uh, rector uh, of this important university uh, who is involved in defending democracy. Uh, abolishing a university means uh, getting rid of democracy, and that's a bad sign. It's an alarming signal. We have to fight to defend liberty and democracy and make sure these grow in on our continent. The European Union is based, it's founded on these values. Thank you, Rector, very much. Thank you, Giver Ofstadt. Thank you to all the colleagues who spoke, and I want to thank all of you, er, each and every one of you, for coming here, because we need unity. Unity, united political parties, it doesn't matter what the political colour. We need unity as between the uh, social, uh, 
components, if you like, between the member states. We mustn't underestimate uh, what happens to the University of Budapest, Central European University, isn't just isolated. It's not an isolated case uh, to Hungary. Probably the most alarming figure, if you're talking about the uh, problems, uh, we're seeing a drift towards illiberalism, and we've got to stop this drift. There is no hostility against anyone. There's just uh, hostility f against people who are trying to curb freedom within Europe and outside Europe. That's who we need to be hostile to. And we're at your side. We're all united. We will be united tomorrow at the debate in the mini plenary. We will always be united, not in order to gain advantage for uh, any group or any party, no, to uh, secure an advantage uh, in relation to matters that we achieve are very, feel are very important. Culture, university, universities, and freedom. If we allow these values to be killed off, then we will share some of the responsibility in the death of these values. So we will be strong uh, because the credibility of the European Union uh, is at stake here. Thank you. So I want to thank you all for uh, your presence in this in, in important issue. I, I hope that uh, this call for unity that we show here today, uh, Mr. Ignatiev, uh, that we can maintain it tomorrow and that the disunity will create the pressure uh, for, in fact, a change in Hungary so that your institution and academic freedom can continue. Thank you very much. Thank you.